My name is Guy Fedorko. Uh, I am here uh, from, uh, from the United States. I apologize. I have to be unilingual today. Um, <clears throat> uh, I have been working on this uh, program for a uh, project for Whirlwind for a couple of years, um, in, in, uh, along with the MIT Museum and also with the Computer History Museum in California. Uh, and now, of course, with uh, HNF as well in uh, Paderborn. Um, what I want to talk about today a little bit is the whirlwind machine, uh, some of the background and some of the some of its architecture, and then switch to one particular application that we spent time working on. Um, as as far as I can tell, the first demo in the world for using a computer for air defense for tracking incoming. Uh, uh, attackers and directing interceptors. So we'll talk about that, and and we can show all of the software in the um, in the demonstration down the hall. Okay, so let's start. The first part then is about what is this whirlwind machine. Um, it was a one of a kind research computer designed in the 1950s. Uh, it first started working in 1949 and stayed at MIT functionally until about 1958. Um, the program was begun under a contract from the U.S. Navy, so this was all done under the Department of Defense in the U.S. Um, MIT did a lot of work uh, during, war, during the war, uh, did a lot of defense work. Um, <clears throat> It, to an extent that became quite controversial later in the in the decades, um, but this was done with uh, with the Navy. Their intention in initially was to design an aircraft simulator that is for training pilots. Um, that evolved, as all good research projects do, uh, evolved from that into uh, air traffic control and finally into guiding uh, interceptor aircraft. Um, the machine itself is a 16-bit parallel architecture. This was at a time when serial architectures were uh, all the rage. Um, uh, and it was designed to be fast. So this, this would have been one of the, uh, the fastest computer on the block at the time. Um, 50,000 ads per second, how fast can you possibly need? Um, the, the project is now mostly remembered for the development of magnetic core memory. Th this was developed at MIT. Uh, there were a number of teams working on magnetic core, and <clears throat> it took quite a few years in uh, of legal dispute to agree that MIT actually, quote, invented uh, magnetic core memory. Um, the machine was initially built with uh, electrostatic CRT memory, and they tried for years and could not get it to be reliable. Um, the program uh, project uh, evolved substantially. This started as a, as a small project in the um, servo mechanisms lab where they had experience with radar tracking for uh, aiming anti-aircraft guns um, and eventually evolved into the um, U.S. Air Force semi-automatic, semi-automated ground environment, SAGE, which was a humongous program for uh, continental air defense. Um, the contract allowed MIT to use, uh, uh, it gave the Department of Defense the good hours during the day, but it gave uh, MIT researchers the less good hours of the day. Um, and they used it to, for many, many different kinds of applied mathematics research projects in um, around MIT. Um, and it stayed on campus until about 1959. <clears throat> Um, the machine ultimately was, dis, uh, let's say, disassembled, um, and many of the pieces saved uh, around 1970. Um, but the, the the machine itself is will never exist again. It's it's long gone. 
Um, some of the timelines, uh, they say they started in 44, thinking they were going to build an analog aircraft simulator. Um, in 1945, I think Jay Forrester, the program lead, saw ENIAC and um, decided that digital computers were the thing that they wanted to do. Um, by 1948, I haven't figured out quite what happened, but by 1948 they decided, uh, aircraft uh, simulator, no, we're not going to do that. Um, <clears throat> Uh, by 1949, they had enough machine running to uh, display simple e equations on a on a CRT display. Um, 1951, we'll come back to this one, the first radar intercept demo. 1952, they started on SAGE, the air defense system, so the whirlwind team um, became the uh, the system architects for SAGE, along with uh, 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 IBM and a couple of other very large contractors. Um, by 1953, they had a thing called the, quote, Cape Cod system, which again was centered on Whirlwind to, to demonstrate some more of the, the SAGE technology. Um, 1953 also was the date that they switched from electrostatic to core memory, and that is <clears throat> an important date in the history of the machine because at that point it became reliable enough that anyone could believe that this was really going to be useful for something. I have no idea how they convinced the Air Force to spend so much money when the electrostatic tubes were just not working very well. But Jay Forrester, the project lead, was a very persuasive guy. Uh, and then 1959 was when it was decommissioned. Um, this computer would work fine in a 1950s science fiction movie. Um, it had all the things, whirling tape drives, hundreds of blinking lights, switches. Um, you will notice there is not a keyboard in sight. Uh, they did add a keyboard quite late in the program uh, project. Um, this is Jay Forrester, who's the project lead. This is Bob Everett, who is the guy who keeps the trains running on time. This often happens, this pairing often happens in these kinds of computer projects. This is the guy who's got the big ideas and can't quite remember how to tie his shoes. And this is the guy who says, uh, boss, yeah, okay, good, yeah, yeah, we're working on that. And could you go away while we're, and don't think up anything else just right away. Um, this uh, a, a woman I know whose name is Romana, but we don't know anything much more about her, but that is sitting in front of one of the larger CRT displays that they used. Um, the machine itself, uh, people in this room probably have heard of digital equipment deck computers. Yeah, okay. Um, uh, Ken Olson was one of the engineers on Whirlwind. So he was a, a junior engineer, uh, along with Harlan Anderson, uh, on <coughs> Whirlwind. And by about 1957, I think, had left Whirlwind because, you know, like, hey, we could start a company. And so I think you will find the architecture looks spookily familiar. <laughs> um, Sage also was, uh, uh, w once this turned into SAGE, uh, IBM took a very large role in, in designing the equipment and consequently, <clears throat> uh, while the 701 was designed following von Neumann, um, 704 and on also has whirlwind influence. So the architecture is familiar because <laughs> Almost every computer we have has lineage back to either IBM or or uh, DEC. Um, the machine was a very straightforward von Neumann machine, what we would now recognize as von Neumann. In fact, von Neumann visited the Whirlwind uh, site a number of times. We've seen his name in the visitor log. Um, uh, 
the standard thing, right? Memory, program counter, one accumulator, a second half of the accumulator for 32-bit uh, numbers, um, <clears throat> a boot ROM, which was 32 words of toggle switches, so you would literally toggle the, the boot ROM and then push the start button and it would jump to zero and run. Um, and then quite a large list of I.O. devices which continued to grow. Uh, there's, you know, the, the I.O. instruction set is much more complicated than the um, computing instruction set for this machine. Uh, because of the real-time focus, they kept on bolting on more stuff. Um, this, this audience will be well aware that computers used to be kind of big. Um, so this was one, one machine, uh, about 2,500 square feet for the, the, the computer itself. Um, Oops, sorry. Uh, that would be the ALU. So a 16-bit ALU was uh, 16 racks. Bit slice machine, right? Very ahead of its time. Um, this was uh, five, five registers of um, a programmable memory uh, made of flip-flops, uh, made of vacuum tubes, I'm, I'm sorry. Uh, and then the rest is, you know, control and all that stuff. When they added core memory, um, some of some of this stuff uh, went away, <coughs> of course, to uh, to put in the core memory. Um, the basement of the machine was full of power supplies. This, the first floor of the machine had the uh, drums and uh, uh, some of the other peripherals, and then this is the second floor floor of the machine. Um, this was built in a machine, uh, in a building at MIT called the Barta Building, and the building is still there, and it's right across the street from where the MIT Museum used to be. Um, it has been renovated many times and is now occupied by a pharmaceutical company, but uh, there's, a, there's an IEEE plaque on the building to say this is where they built Whirlwind. Um, Again, this audience would be well aware of this, but most people I run into and say, wow, it, w it must have been really big, like bigger than a, a refrigerator even. And say, yeah, it's bigger than a fridge. <laughs> yeah, a lot bigger than a fridge. Um, the I.O. system, there was the usual stuff. Um, they used a machine called a flexo writer, like a teletype machine. Um, paper tape was the the medium of choice, the uh, the original source for all of the software that went into the machine. Uh, they added they added tape magnetic tapes early. Uh, they added drum storage a little bit later, and uh, they added a line printer later th than that. Um, the not so familiar stuff. Uh, as you saw, there are not only in the control room are there hundreds of buttons and lights just to see what's going on, but the actual operation of the machine was focused around buttons and lights. Right? It's a, it's in their view a real-time application. So you've got consoles with guys sitting at the console with looking at buttons and lights and, and looking at CRTs. Um, there is uh, the graphical output capability, uh, which Reiner will talk about a little more, um, that was <clears throat> intentionally designed from the start for drawing images on a, on a CRT. Uh, so this was not, a, a, this is not a character-oriented display. What they do is literally they draw lines and dots. Um, the CRT, uh, the system also there was a camera attached so that uh, you could get hard copies of your output and if you want to do a core dump in fact they would cycle through core on the CRT and flash it with the camera uh, because the printer was not there um, 
The second unusual thing is the so-called light gun, which we would call a light pen, um, which uh, anyone outside of this room would recognize as uh, sort of like a mouse right, for pointing at the screen and in indicating points. Um, they developed this, this is uh, less known and, and quite unique, but developed mechanisms to connect to remote radar stations across uh, telephone lines. So it wasn't exactly a modem, but they did encode radar signals, uh, digitized radar signals in um, on telephone lines to get from uh, a, a radar, a couple of radar stations tens of miles away back to this BARTA building. Um, and then a bunch of other specialized interfaces uh, again, developed for um, SAGE for multiple sites. Crosstel, I think, is the buzzword for my computer. My sector tells your sector, hey, there's a guy coming your way you might want to look at. Um, so this, this would have been a a picture of the, you know one of the CRTs. Um, I, I originally thought this 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 looks like a prop, but I, I think it really is the real thing. There was a there's a little story that they said they hired a a local woodworker to make the display for or the cabinet for this display, and he accidentally made a thing which was. Um, it looked too much like furniture, and they said, oh, my God, the Navy is going to kill us for wasting money. So they had to paint it gray so it didn't look too nice. Um, this would be uh, one of the original light guns. Um, the museum in California has a number of these. I would love to know what's inside, but <clears throat> we have not convinced them to take one apart yet. Um by the time IBM was involved, uh, the light gun had evolved, and the IBM industrial designers knew how to make stuff. Um, I, 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 to me, this picture illustrates why the Navy or the Air Force liked MIT because they could get new stuff that no one had ever thought of before to work, and they liked IBM because they could make stuff and it would stay working. <laughs> um, uh, uh, Whirlwind was a, a continuous science experiment with stuff coming and going and working and not working and all kinds of things. They, they were very interested in reliability and worked hard on it, but it, man, it was tough and they didn't have the right environment for um, manufacturing. Okay, uh, Reiner will spend more time on the um, on the graphics system. Uh, I just want to say the <clears throat> the underlying principle is um, extremely straightforward in a way that uh, people who are accustomed to modern graphics have a hard time uh, sometimes understanding that is how straightforward it is. Uh, all they did was take two digital to analog converters, uh, one for X, one for Y, connect them to oscilloscopes, and then a couple of bits, put uh, 16, some more. Uh, it, anyways, and in our case, we are only using two um, to uh, modulate the Z axis to turn the bit on and off. So if you want to draw a point on the screen, you set the D to A's to the point you want, and then you flip the the Z bit for a you know, blip the Z bit a bit and it will display the point when the Z bit goes away then you move the beam somewhere else and display another point and that's all there is uh, if you <clears throat> the good news is um, you don't have to do garbage collection if you want to erase the display you just stop <laughs> and it's gone um, this is a little hard to emulate, um, but that's what there was, and that's what Reiner's, Reiner's uh, kit does. 
Okay, again, this, this will uh, be quite familiar for this crowd, but the um, uh, whirlwind, I, I like to tell people it's sort of like an Arduino, except slow. <laughs> um, but the, the approximate memory capacities are similar. There's the 2K words of, of RAM, um, 32K words of uh, disk, uh, drum space, for, sorry, 48K of drum space. Um, the power is a little different. <laughs> Um, the third column here, the uh, at the time, the, if you wanted to do a large calculation, what you did was you hired a room full of computers, that is, people uh, who um, were, <coughs> quote, programmed to uh, do steps in, in a repetitive calculation of some sort. Um, so the United States had a it, it had a thing called the Math Tables Project uh, during the Depression, um, and at one point had uh, 450 people, computers, working on uh, you know a single tables project. Um, curiously, 450 people, aside from what you have to buy for lunch, um, uh, adds up to about 60 kilowatts of power. So it's uh, you know it's kind of a, in the same ballpark. Um, that makes fifty thousand ads per second look really fast, right? And that's of course we all know why this was a ground changer. Uh, Whirlwind was also expensive. Um, it consumed at one point. 80% uh, of the budget of the Office of Naval Research. Um, and <clears throat> the program had a bit of a an existential crisis um, in about 1951, where the Navy said, uh, where is our aircraft simulator? And MIT said, well, here's this computer. It's really cool. You'll love it a lot. And the Navy said, uh, excuse me, <laughs> where is our aircraft simulator? <laughs> uh, fortunately, at that point, the Air Force, fortunately for Whirlwind, not the rest of us, um, in 1949, we'll cover this again, the um, Soviet Union tested a nuclear weapon and the Air Force was going, oh my God, what are we going to do? Um, and uh, picked up funding for Whirlwind to, to change the focus to air defense. Um, but one reason I can say with some confidence that this was the first of something or another is that the program was so expensive there could not have been another one. If it uses half the budget, then there is not another one bigger. Okay, so what is this project about? Uh, what is my project about? Um, the MIT, MIT, it's not just the museum, the MIT and, the, and its archives have many whirlwind documents. Uh, as a Department of Defense project, they were required to submit reports all the time. Uh, and so there are <coughs> many uh, many documents. Uh, it, it, the librarians list gives 8,000 of them. I, I know about 2,000 exist. Um, the Computer History Museum has hundreds of tapes, uh, paper tapes and magnetic tapes. And of course, two sides of the country. Oops. Well, okay. So what do we get if we put these together? Um, there are some physical artifacts around, but not very many. Um, uh, so there's not a lot to learn from that, but there's enough that you can see kind of what it was like. So the question, of course, can we, can we combine all these resources and learn something about the evolution of this machine? Um, and can we somehow make this material more accessible to non-specialists? Uh, the tapes in particular had been sitting on a shelf in the museum for 
50 years uh, and it occurred to us all that it, it sitting on the shelf they weren't actually helping much and so um, they have been read and we're gradually interpreting them um, how did whirlwind programmers program people often say oh that must have been an assembler language and I'm saying yeah it was <clears throat> in in the early stage of the program it was pencil and paper um, so you the programmer see it was a, a, a multimedia graphical presentation with uh, sketch comments um, yeah so you would write out your program uh, on a coding sheet if you were lucky and then hand it to a typist who uh, uh, you the programmer are probably responsible for turning this into octal code and then handing it to a typist who is responsible for turning the octal into flexo codes and and typing it on a paper tape um, so you you'd write it out on a, on a coding sheet type onto paper tape the programmer gets uh, a scheduled time slot runs it it crashes you go back and try and figure out what to do and hope that you get another run um, that night um, they uh, they the the project was structured in two, uh, two parts there was the the primary application component of the machine of course for developing um, you know what they the the use of the machine but the the Navy funded continued to fund development of um, tools for search this was at a time when everyone was coming to the realization that uh oh these things are hard to program we better think about this so the quote automatic programming was uh, all the thing in the in mid 50s and at the time MIT was um, you know one of the one of the three major contenders in the in how do how should you program computers um, so they rapidly developed an assembler and then gradually made the assembler more uh, sophisticated paper tapes this of course carried through to the deck world and uh, as soon as IBM was involved with Sage whirlwind grew a card reader um, okay so of the software media um, all of the as far as we know all of the tapes have been read they're posted on bit savers so CHM read them Al Coso posted them on his bit saver site um, we've read about 60 of <clears throat> the hundred magnetic tapes um, those are much uh, harder to figure out some of them some of the both the formats are obvious uh, and and we are using some of that material uh, some of them I expect we'll never figure out because they're data tapes for some application that we can't figure out um, but there's there's still a lot of decoding there um, and of course what we have been doing the way this works is we've we we can sometimes link a document on a program with the, the actual code of the program so the the air defense one is an excellent example of that um, there are a few others where we have an actual document which describes the functioning of the program and then we have the program itself uh, I haven't found the the index for the tape department Um, documents yeah it's 8,000 titles uh, 1800 of them or so are on MIT's site um, Al <coughs> Caso has about 280 some of them overlap but there are actually some that are are unique on Al's site um, the Smithsonian this is a problem has 30 boxes of these documents and I've have an index and have looked at some of them but that's a lot of stuff 
and there was a there was a whirlwind project photographer who spent I don't know if he's literally full time, but there was a guy who spent during the, the decade uh, his career uh, taking pictures of things in whirlwind. Okay, in my project, um, uh, I have developed a tool chain to help um, reverse engineer and then re-engineer some of this code. Um, the general flow, we start with the binary tapes and, in, and some of the source code tapes now. Those are um, uh, hard to use in a different way. Um, uh, so decode the tapes, um, disassemble the, the binary objects, the machine instruction set is very straightforward, so the disassembly, uh, rough disassembly is easy enough. Um, uh, I can then add comments to the assembler uh, code if I can figure out what it does. Um, reassemble that and run the run the image on uh, in a simulation environment. And of course, the the trick here is to go around this loop a hundred times to run it, say, what the heck is that doing? Oh, I see, go back and comment the code some more and insert um, a debug assistance along the way so that you can start to understand the function of the program. Um, here is a sample uh, Reiner can run this on uh, on the d display in the, in the other room. Um, we came across this tape, <laughs> which had blackjack written on it. <laughs> uh, blackjack is a card game, also known as 21. Um, as far as we can tell, this was a completely unofficial uh, a bit of work. There, I, we have not found a single document that even mentions it. Um, and the structure of the code is looks like a mess I, and I so I suspect it was graduate students at three in the morning um, who were just figuring out how to use a computer but it does play a a respectable game of blackjack um, it uses the light gun so um, there's again no keyboard interaction but you hit um, points on the screen to make it do things so the one, the one on the top right, uh, for example, shuffles the card deck. <clears throat> um, these are the two critical ones where the player can say, um, "I want to play the next card," or uh, "You play the next card," and that, and that at that point you can tell who's won. Um, so uh, this this code works. You can see the uh, character generator is uh, it, it, it is a seven segment vector generator so it doesn't um, you know there's no rasters, there's no bitmaps uh, all you can do is draw any combination of the uh, seven different segments so sometimes they have to get a little creative in uh, how you make a character that uh, that does not say C A A D S. Of course, that says C A R D S. Okay, um, I want to switch topics now to the air defense application. Um, okay, we we know about the machine. Um, this application, there was, of course, the the Soviet test in in uh, 1949, which um, uh, has <clears throat> people who have seen the movie Oppenheimer might know um, the U.S. government had declared to be not possible, um, and suddenly when it was, it was uh oh. Um, so uh, MIT had all of these defense connections and the Air Force sponsored a competition 
I'm not sure whether MIT's thumb was already on the scale or not, but uh, there was a competition for um, what should we do for air defense for the continental U.S. Um, and uh, MIT, of course, responded with what you need is a computer. And we happen to have one, and it's, yeah, it's kind of expensive, but don't worry. Um, and, of course, SAGE ultimately became a very large program. I, I think at the time, $30 billion uh, went into SAGE. Um, okay, so in 1951, uh, <clears throat> there's a guy named David Israel who was part of the whirlwind team and I think spent his entire life working on radars, computers, and airplanes. Um, but he assembled a demo um, which was intended to steer an interceptor aircraft towards a target aircraft. I, 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 I can't help being amused that they officially started work with radar and airplanes and computers on air traffic control, where, of course, the goal is to make sure they do not collide, and switched the sign bit and changed it into uh, air defense, where the goal is to make sure they do collide. Um, so the, the, we'll see the goal of the program, of course, is for the radar operator to be as hit. That's the target, you know, that's the attacker, that's the defender, go get them. Um, the document which describes this is uh, unusually straightforward and clear. Um, in modern times, you'd say, well, of course, that's a functional spec. You describe the problem. Uh, they did the mathematical analysis uh, a software uh, flowchart, commentary on the code, and then the actual code. Um, the astonishing thing is that this fit into 256 words of code. That's all there was uh, at the time. This was in the era before they had the magnetic core, and the electrostatic memory was very troublesome. Um, so they had a small amount of core uh, of, um, of main memory to work with and used every word. Okay, uh, so here's the scenario for how you use this thing. Um, the assumption is that you have a radar, a radar station, there is a target of some sort that you, you think you're trying to defend. Um, there are aircraft in the vicinity the radar operator, of course, uh, the radar operator has to know somehow which one is which, because that's what their job is, is to figure out who's the, you know, who's, who is the attacker and, and where the defenders are. Um, so all they see on the screen is, is there are, you know, there are blips here and there. Um, <clears throat> in this scenario for this simulation, uh, I know that this this guy is the interceptor, and these two guys are attackers. And so in my simulation, I set I set you know initial conditions for these guys, um, uh, where um, both of the attackers are heading for uh, a, a target which I have arbitrarily placed at the northern edge of the screen. Um, so what the operator is supposed to do is watch the scopes for incoming attackers. Um, there's, a, there's again, switches, buttons, and lights. So you switch the switch to say, uh, I see an attacker, and you use the light gun to point to the attacker and say, computer, this guy is an attacker, watch him. And then you switch the switch, and you tell the computer, computer, this guy is the interceptor I would like to use right now. Follow that, please. And <clears throat> when the operator has identified both of them, then the computer can compute a, a heading, a direction to fly for the interceptor that will cause the interceptor 
in a, not exactly the most efficient way, but as as close as they could get to efficient to uh, bring them close together. And once they're within a mile or two, then the the guy in the whirlwind uh, uh, control room can take a break, and it's up to the interceptor pilot from there. Um, <clears throat> It displays, uh, as we'll see, displays on the scopes, the uh, on, two on two oscilloscopes, one, all of the radar traffic, and the uh, on the other oscilloscope, the two that it's actually tracking and trying to converge. Um, as the program runs, every radar scan, it will compute a new heading, because, of course, the target, the... the um, Attackers might say, hey, there's someone coming at me. I'm going to, you know, change my course. Uh, so it uh, <clears throat> continuously updates the heading uh, for the interceptor to go towards wherever it thinks the target, uh, the attacker is going. Um, the result of the resulting heading is displayed on lights, of course. In <clears throat> in binary coded decimal, and the ra the radar operator's job is to read off the headings from the whirlwind, and talk on the phone to the pilot to say, "Yo, dude, the new heading is 329," and the pilot steers to 329. Um, so that's that's the way the program works. Um, in our environment, what I want to try and do is help see which part of this is actually real code and which is, you know, sub a substantial simulation environment. Um, the so the real code is running, of course, in the simulated whirlwind. As I said, there are only two hundred and fifty-six words of this stuff. Um, uh, so under underneath this is, of course. It's a straightforward whirlwind instruction simulator um, along with the simulated buttons and lights and stuff. Um, on the right-hand side, then, we, we simulate the um, graphical system. Uh, Reiner's system is a little bit closer to real with the uh, hardware, but that's uh, uh, our modern interpretation of it. Um, it's a little more complicated on the left hand side uh, there is in my simulation environment is the radar station which transmits um, uh, uh, headings and azimuth across the uh, telephone lines so um, this simulated radar station acts as as enough like the real radar station so that this thing can interpret the codes. Um, and then ahead of that are the simulated airplanes. So, uh, you know, I set the initial tracks. Um, when the whirlwind operator reads off the lights <clears throat> to say the heading, then I'm feeding the interceptor headings back into the aircraft uh, myself. So I am not making Reiner read the numbers and steer the steer the interceptor um, so th uh, there's a lot of stuff here but the but this piece of code in the middle is running on un unchanged uh, there were a, as usual a couple of typos um, but other than fixing the typos uh, it, it's running as as it did in 1951. Um, and I can't help but point out <laughs> the stuff around is 40, 40, 50 megabytes of stuff to connect to a 256-word <clears throat> program. Jay Forrester would say, you are out of your reeking mind to waste 50 megabytes. Um, okay, uh, this is what the... Um, air defense screen looks like uh, this to me has been completely vexing this is one of the most um, 
in terms of uh, the de development of, of the air defense application and real-time computing, this has to be one of the most significant demos that was ever done, right? That this, this, this would have been just jaw-dropping at the time, right? There would have been uh, generals and stuff watching this to see real airplanes flying real flight paths with real radar stations with a computer in real time saying, pilot, steer this way. And they would watch the radar and they would intercept. Um, in modern terms, as a demo, this is the most boring thing you've ever seen. Um, because when it's, uh, you know, wh when, you, when you look at it, it's just, you know, a couple of dots moving across the screen. Um, so it's a little hard to get this across in a <clears throat> in a live in a live demo but um you, but you can see how it goes um again I, I do this with one screen on the laptop Reiner has two screens uh so he can see the entire radar situation and then the two tracks the uh, the two uh, uh, uh airplanes that are being tracked as it as they converge um, there's uh, uh, my own output there to uh, help us figure out what the heck is supposed to be, what, what's going on. Um, so this this is the heading that Whirlwind is computing. That would be <coughs> in BCD 330, 3, 330 degrees heading for the interceptor pilot. And in the in the real code, of course, when they intercept, nothing happens because they're just watching the radar. So, uh, if the uh, if the interceptor pilot is is good enough to uh, to to down the attacker, then one of the blips would disappear. Otherwise, they just fly off and go home. Um, oh, and the interceptor pilots were not allowed to down the attackers. It was against the rules. And in fact, they flew at different altitudes just in case it worked. Because <laughs> uh, the attacker pilots wanted to get home at night. Uh, and I read which aircraft they flew. I don't remember. It wasn't, they were not exotic airplanes. Um, a curious thing is if we actually analyze the results of this tracking program, um, uh, if, I, if I don't mess with a thing, the, the uh, attacker, of course, stays on a completely straight path because that's the way I programmed it. Um, the defender should intercept here, but um, actually intercepts a little bit further down, and I'm still working on figuring out why are these not quite right. Um, I know uh, part of it is an artifact here where it starts out thinking its <coughs> interceptor is roughly zero velocity, which, of course, if the interceptor is zero velocity, you're, you've got a long way to go before you're going to get an intercept. Um, so it starts out too far north and then correct, but uh, I don't know why it doesn't come closer. That's one we're still trying to figure out. Uh, okay, so let me start to wrap up here. The uh, uh, key observation, of course, is <clears throat> it works. It's not quite optimal. I'm not sure why. Um, and there's... a. a because of the way the code is structured, not only does it use the 256 words, but you can tell they they had to work at it to get it to fit. Right? There are various things in there that surely no one would do unless they needed one more word somewhere else. Um, so I, I assume there are approximations in there that I haven't that I don't understand yet. Uh, Ironically, the trigonometric functions 
you know, sines and cosines and tangents all seem to be accurate, which is surprising in a, such a small piece of code. Um, one lesson that I would draw from this is, whoa, this must have been just misery to debug. I have no idea how they did it, uh, other than the obvious thing of banging their heads on the wall a lot. Um, it's a real-time program, and they didn't have any <coughs> debug framework. Um, there wasn't any spare memory to put handy print statements in, and the printer is too slow anyways, because if you printed 10 characters, you'd miss 20, 20 radar readings. Um, so uh, we know that they ordered a couple of um, analog multi-track recorders, uh, tape recorders, so they could record the actual flight tests and play them back over and over again. But it still must have been just total misery debugging this stuff. I can only expect that they had quite a few graduate students who got locked in a room with a source code and not let out until they could manually work through every instruction and demonstrate how the program was supposed to be working or not. Um, I think, you know, the code review would have been more like hardware design than what we think of as software design. Um, but I, I, I oddly have not found a lot of material on how they did that stuff. I think it was just part of the landscape, you know, of course it's miserable. What can you do about it? Um, okay. Uh, what I want to do going forward then is to um, try to follow the um, the development of this air defense application. It, it, this demo uh, obviously was influential um, and somehow eventually became Sage, and there must have been a lot of stuff that happened in between. I'm trying to see how the impact of this work spread. Um, on a completely different thread, there's, there's quite a bit of material available on their development of this automatic programming environment. Um, and they eventually ended up with something that looks a little bit like an operating system that most of the whirlwind material is bare metal code. Um, but eventually they got to a point where <clears throat> they didn't actually have to reload everything every time someone wanted to run something. And I, and I think it would be interesting to dig a little bit harder through that stuff and uh, understand a bit more how the machine was used for the other applications. And that is my favorite picture from from the Whirlwind Photo Archive. Um, uh, it was scheduled for June 1st, 1959, which is shut down. They actually um, turned it off a couple of days ahead of that, I think, to avoid any accidents. Okay. Uh, the um, documents, uh, uh, BitSavers, of course, is well known. Uh, MIT Whirlwind is the place to look. Uh, MIT is uh, is public. Uh, many of the tape images, all of the paper tape and some of the magnetic tapes are on BitSavers and I have a GitHub site with the uh, simulator. Um, Reiner will talk about this in more in more detail, uh, Reiner's focus has been on the uh, vector interface, the the um, actual graphical interface part of this stuff, and has <coughs> together produced uh, um, two things. One is the underlying interface mechanism that is spliced into my simulator so that we can run real whirlwind code and display the results. Um, but uh, Reiner has a number of, of programs which are modern programs written to exercise that and demonstrate the uh, the graphical environment. So this this um, 
menu is from a is from a program dispatcher that that projects on the screen and you can use the light gun to say I want to run uh, you know I want to run number nine and number nine is linked to the vibrate the uh, whirlwind vibrating string demo okay with that I think I can stop do you want to switch to yours okay y yes oh thank you oh oh the remote microphone yes um, so you had this diagram with this, uh, like this flowchart with the simulator on one end, and I think the um, the the input on the other end. And in any case, so you have you have all of these this code that you've recovered on uh, a yeah yeah I I think this one so or the or the flow the tools uh, flow. Uh, I think it was yes this this one this one. Um, so so you've recovered. Uh, all of these these tapes, all of the, this code, which you know you've recovered imperfectly, but also the simulator. I mean, how can you know that the simulator is a match to what the actual hardware was? I oh, mean, well, is indeed. there any uncertainty there? I guess is my question. Yes. Uh, how do we know the simulator is simulating the real the real instruction set? Um, in fact, of course. At some level, that's a bit of a metaphysical question, <laughs> because the, the instruction set itself evolved. Um, fortunately, not much. Right there was a there was a major change in the instruction set around 1952, and after that, it stayed quite stable. Um, there is a document. Thank God. It survived, uh, published in 1958, which is the uh, definition of the instruction set for programmers. And that, uh, that document, I think, had been evolved and reviewed and evolved and reviewed for years. And, uh, and I think we found it to be very accurate. There are a couple of areas that seem suspiciously vague um, so where we might not have quite the right thing but um, but fortunately the instruction set, the the later instantiation of the instruction set um, is is quite well documented um, the tapes do have some diagnostic pro well, the tapes have quite a few diagnostic programs some of them we've been able to get to work um, and of course, that's a that's a clue as well that if the diagnostics run, then it probably runs. Um, uh, I, I have been surprised that again the instruction set is very straightforward. There are only thirty five instructions, and there's only one addressing mode. Um, uh, one's complement arithmetic is um, not fundamentally that hard, but uh, it, it certainly introduces a little bit of confusion here and there. Um, but other than that, I think it's been w relatively straightforward to decode the instruction set. The I.O. system, not so much, but but that's that's what we use as confidence for the thing. Other questions? Is this your personal private work, or are you funded by something, <laughs> some institution? Money. Oh, I don't know whether we can talk about <laughs> money in a place like this. Um, what is a diplomatic answer to that, Reiner? Um, well, yeah. You get support from uh, the museum that you mentioned, and uh, most of this, I think, is your private. Uh, yeah. So enterprise. yeah, let's leave money out of it. But yeah, it, it is done in conjunction with the with the three institutions. Um, and uh, MIT has been generous enough to, you know, provide workspace and so on. So I spend three days a week at the MIT museum on this and and other related stuff. Okay.